Hello, it's Duncan. Over the past few episodes, we built a tool to allow us to instrument and visualize the timeline of our test runs. Today, we'll put that to use to try and debug why our database tests are taking so long. On the way, we have to solve the problem of allowing our production code to interact with our test implementation. This introduces dependency inversion, where we decouple high and low level code through a shared interface. Am I right? I'm a right. I'm still banging on about how long my tests take to run. This is a test run. You can see that in total it took 2.25 seconds, of which the actual tests took that time 1,000 milliseconds, so one second. And as you can see, for pretty much all of that second, DB items test was running. Some other tests were run as well in parallel. You can see days two tests running there, conjured age pre updating tests, and so on. And these are able to run in parallel because we have parallel enabled true here in our JNet platform properties. And I've turned the parallelism down a bit to only four. So we should only have four tests running at a time. And I think you can see that here where init Jackson finishes running, that allows add item tests to start running because the thread will be released here and able to run this one. Right, we've previously spent some time instrumenting this DB items tests. You see here we've got this loaded constructor one, constructor two, and so on. These are events that we can plot on this timeline. As DB items test consistently takes up pretty much all the time, I propose to run just it so we're not confused by running other tests. So let's do that. We'll come in here and we'll say run DB items tests. Here we go. Have a look at that. And yes, we just ran that one test. When I say one test, it's a one test suite. It's all the tests. And there's one test here and another one there and another one there and there and so on. Right then, let's have a look at these events and see whether we can understand what they're telling us. The first bar here is all of our test runs. So that's all the test suites we're running, which is only one at the moment, DB items tests. The second bar then is the DB items tests. And the fact that this DB items test loaded is inside this bar, or at least underneath it, shows that this code was run after Jane. It considered that it started running the DB items tests. That's quite interesting because it means this class wasn't loaded as part of finding the DB items tests. JUnit knew that DB items tests existed and had these tests in it, and then the class was loaded. Okay, after that, we had this DB items test constructor one and two, and they're here and here. But you can also see that they're here and here. And that's because what JNIT does when it comes to run a test is for each one of these tests, for example, this returns empty stock list before any save. That's, well, confusingly, it's in the items contract. It's one of the tests. There we go. Before it invokes the test method, JNIT creates an instance of DB items tests. So the properties like items here are fresh between each test. Interestingly, though, that's accounted for outside this returns empty stock list before any save here. So Jane, it says it's starting the test here, but in order to run it, it had to create an instance of this class, and that happened here. Well, actually, it happened between here and here, and that's an awful long time. And it's also, interestingly, an awful long time only the first time, because this is the gap there. But the gap here, before it runs this next test, returns last save stop list, is very, very much smaller. Now, what code is running between here and here? Well, it's this bit here. So this code appears to be taking at least 200 on milliseconds, but only the first time we run it. Now, what are we actually running here? Well, we're running the constructor DB items, and we are referring to test DSL context. And that is, in fact, just at the top of this file here. Now, that's a top level property. So there's only going to be one of it. So this code is only going to be run once. But it might be that creating the DB items is taking time, or it might be creating the test DSL context is taking time. And creating the test DSL context is composed itself of two things. One is this creation of a DB config, which in turn requires creation of a URI. And then there's this two DSL context here, which is creating a Hari data source, and then whatever this DSL using is doing. So let's see if we can differentiate. We can create a scope in Kotlin with run. So we can say run DB items, and then we could do something before that. So we could put in before that, we could say we could have an event and a nice little convention here is to say create with a right arrow. And then after this, we could say create with a left arrow like that. So we'd see them on the chart. The problem is that run evaluates to the last expression and that is unit from this. So that's no use to us, but we can put an also in here like that. And I think that would allow us to take out that one and that one. Let's just have a look. Okay, and here you can see that create 
starts here and ends here. So that's still our big gap for the first time we run it. But only for the first time we run it because the second create here is pretty much instant, as is this one. Let's see how much of the time that this code takes to run is creating the DB items versus the test DSL context. We could do that by pulling the same stunt here with also. So we could say dot also timing extension event created test DSL context. Yeah, that will do. Okay, then here we can see here's our created test DSL context. It's there. We can see there's a big gap between this here and having finished here. So that's that gap here. And then create is over almost immediately. And I think that explains why these creates are over so quickly. Because when we call this create, the code here to create this test DSL context has already been run and squirreled away in this variable. So we're not seeing this created test DSL context here inside here. And as that's the thing that's taking time, this one is slow and this one is quick, as are all the other ones down here. So what is it about two DSL contexts that's taking so much time? Let's have a look. Here it is. OK, in here we create an Hikari data source. And having created it, we validate it. And then we pass that to this DSL using, which is part of Duke. Now we could instrument that the same sort of way if we pull out the two bits. So we could make a variable out of this thing. It's a rubbish name, but that's OK. And then if we put a checkpoint in here with timing extension event, then we better see where in here this was, whether it was creating the Hikari data source or the DSL using that was taking the time. There's a problem, though, and that is that timing extension is inside our test tree. So it's here, which is to say in source test. But because it's in source test, our code in source main can't see it because test can see main, but main can't see test. We might want to solve that problem by just moving the time extension into our main test tree. But timing extension needs to implement test execution listener, which is part of JUnit and therefore only in the class path of our tests. So what to do? And I think the answer is to give our production code a view into our test timing. So we can do that. I'm going to create a new Kotlin class. It's going to be, I think, an interface. And it is going to be com yielded rows testing. And let's call it test timing, I think. And let's add that. So now in our production code here, let's say that we should be able to talk to test timing event. And now can we import that? No, that's a bit strange. Go to test timing, add companion object. Back to configuring, still not there. Hmm. OK, let me type it for you, IntelliJ. Import com gilded rows testing test timing. Ah, so now you can find it. And having found it, let's move our timing extension over there. We want to move the static thing here, this event, from the timing extension to the test timing. So in fact, let's take that thing and move it into here. Now, the instance can't be a timing extension because that's in a test tree but it can be a test timing. And that implies that our test timing needs this event. So that's this thing here. Let's take that and put it into our interface. So it will go like that. And this is part of our interface, but will be abstract because we want somebody else to implement it for us. We don't know how to do it in our production code. Let us, though, put in default here is instant now. Right then, how does this instance get to be set? Well, our production code doesn't know, but our test code does. So I think our timing extension in its init can say, does test timing instance exist? If not, then I will initialize it. Now, that's not going to work because timing extension isn't a test timing, but it could be because it can see that code. And that will just make that public and override. So now we've got configuring can see this test timing event. Let's see whether that works. Oh, no. What's our issue? No timing extension exists. We can differentiate between this message here and this one. Check which one we've got by fixing that. What are we getting? We're getting no timing extension exists. So the issue now is that we are calling this version but our timing extension isn't initializing its own instance. I don't think it needs to, though. What we can do is we can take that away altogether. We can say that our timing extension 
is in fact going to talk to test timing. Now it's set it up, so that's test timing dot event, but we can speak to the static one. How's that? Good, good. Let's have a look at that. Ah, here you can see Hikari was created really quite early. Here it is, Hikari created, and that happens quite quickly. But again, there's this big gap now between the Hikari created and DSL using. So whatever DSL using is doing, it's returning a new default DSL context. DSL context is calling itself, is calling super. That code in Duke is taking two, maybe 300 milliseconds, but only the first time we're calling it. We can complete our cutover to test timing by inlining this timing extension event. If I inline that, then all the places that had been calling it will now be calling this test timing event. Let's go and find that, find the corners of that, and there are all those places. Good. And then finally, instead of having this code in here, I think it would be better to have it in test timing. So we could have an init function in here that took a test timing. There you go. And set the instance, although it would first of all check. So we'll take that code and we will put that in there. And that will be another test timing exists. That does that. We'll fix that. We don't need the reset that uh, I thought we might or that. And now the code in timing extension can say test timing init this. That can go and we can make this private because now nobody knows about it. Am I right? I'm all right. Depending on our exact use case, we might need to be a little bit careful if this code has been called by multiple threads. But here we know that timing extension is only going to be ever created once by JUnit. So I think we're safe enough for now. Right then. You can see here DB items test has one, two, three, four, five, in fact, lots of actual test cases within it. And those test cases are defined in this items contract. That's a complication that's sort of getting in the way at the moment. So what I want to do is break down DB items tests into just two things. And I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to go to items contract and I'm going to say all the things that were tests, I don't want to be tests anymore. So I'm going to take that and that. We'll put this back in a minute, but that one. So I'm leaving the functions there, but removing the annotation. So if I go back to DB items test, there is one test left in here that I'm going to remove like that. Let's have a look. So I've run that, no tests are run. And pretty quickly it turns out, although 1.6 seconds still. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create two tests in here. So I'm going to say at test fun one, and one is going to call the simplest test we've got in items contract. It's still here, so that is returns an empty stock list before any save. So let's take that and put it in here, we'll call that. And then I'm going to do the same for another test. So this one's going to be called two, and it's going to do exactly the same thing. Let's have a look. And there we have it, we have two identical tests, one of which takes 427 milliseconds, and one of which takes eight milliseconds. Now, as you can see from here, each test not only calls the constructor, this create from here to here, but also calls before each. That's this here, where we're clearing the database. So let's say in here, we're going to go, this is my truncate. And then after that, let's have a look there. So that should give us an idea of how long these actual tests take to run. But in fact, let's not guess, let's copy that, put it here. Let's say this is one, and then do the same thing in here for two, run that. Okay, what do we have? The first test we run takes about half its time, say 200 milliseconds to truncate the table, and then half its time to do whatever returns empty stock list does. The second test, well, it truncates the table pretty much instantly and runs the test pretty much instantly. So what we're seeing is that these code paths, both creating the test DSL context, this bit from here to here, and truncating the table from here to here and reading the table from here to here, these code paths are taking a lot longer the first time than subsequent times. Now, in a production server where these paths are likely to be traversed quite a bit, that's fine. Almost everyone will see really quick code. For tests, though, it's a bit of a pain. It's not just that running all DB items tests takes up pretty much all of our test time. It's that running the first DB items test takes up pretty much all of our time. If we have a look at the code here, we can see that we're running items in transaction and items load. It would be interesting to know whether it's the transaction setup or the loading of the item that's taking time. I suppose then we could say test timing event 
this is going to be load and then afterwards load let's have a look at that ah here it is yes so it is in fact that load that's taking the time which is here well i'm not convinced this is the most efficient code but knowing that we're testing the empty case we're certainly not going to be parsing much data that's coming back here it might be interesting to ask the question whether the select or the actual fetch is the thing that's taking time we can do that with a little bit of also magic so in here we can say test timing event and this is going to be about to enter the fetch and then this is after we fetched ah that's very interesting because it looks to me in fact like that suggests that the actual fetch is very quick it's only creating whatever this thing is let's pull it out as a where that will do that's the thing that's actually taken the time so let's copy that put that into there so this is we're about to do the where then we've done the where and then let's move the fetch around there which allows us to take that to the top level it would be nice to formulate this event start and event stop thing but that will do and there we go whatever dsl context select from where is taking an awful lot of time this time round, but not the second time we run the test which is all hidden inside that 19 milliseconds down here one last little thing that i think is worth trying which is to run this in the profiler there it is and i'm never really sure how to read a flame graph but you can see here that for all the tests it's this db item test one that, that's taking almost all the time and then the corner constructor is taking a lot of that time and then here's our using load class this is interestingly taking quite a bit of time there clear db that's taking time and then executing our query no i really don't understand these what we do know from the diagram that i do understand though is that running any of our database tests it doesn't matter which one is the thing that's slowing down all of our tests so that if i go back to db item tests and just say disabled and then run all of our tests irritatingly that takes about the same amount of time i suppose if we were to up our parallelism again depending on how many of those tests are doing io we might do better ah oh, we're down to half a second although it's still 1.9 seconds to actually get feedback how quick could we be well let's just pick days two tests and run just that and that says it was 1.3 seconds and there's our test run the actual test only took 58 milliseconds intellij managed to stretch that out personally around that one second feels quick enough but as soon as we're getting to two seconds it really does seem to drag especially as i have to cut bits out of videos in order to make them short enough so what do we do in software when we have a problem we really don't seem to be able to solve well one thing we do is speak to somebody who might solve our problem so i'm going to have a chat with lucas ada who wrote duke to see whether i'm doing anything wrong and the other thing we do is we try and hide the problem we can't solve what does that mean in this context well i think it means not running those database tests as part of our normal suite we've done that for our browser tests for example with this enabled if system property but probably a better way of doing it is to partition our build to move for example the browser test and the database tests out into another gradle module i still have a lot to learn about how to do that sort of thing so if you want to watch another of the infamous duncan bangs his head against gradle videos please subscribe to the channel like this video as i like it when people like it it remains not too late to sign up to my workshop at kotlinconf and last but not least, don't forget the entire reason I originally set up this channel was to advertise the book that I opened at price called Java to Kotlin and Refactoring Guidebook, details of which are in the show notes below. Thanks for watching.